Welcome back everyone to the channel. Tonight's video, I am bringing you five terrifying RV horror stories. Sit back, relax, dim the lights, and let's get spooky. A few years ago, my boyfriend and I went RV camping in the south around November. We passed through the panhandle of Texas and decided to stop in a small town called Desdemona. We fueled up and chose a quiet area to park the RV. Down the road a little ways was a small, fairly typical southern restaurant slash bar called Boomtown, and we decided we could use a bite to eat. Not five minutes afterwards, we sat ourselves at a table. The waitress who was coming towards us suddenly stopped, eyes wide and terrified, and she quickly ran back to the kitchen. The manager shortly came out and asked us brashly to leave. No explanation, just, get out, you are not welcome here. My boyfriend was confused, because even though we didn't fit the typical southern look, we weren't dressed outrageously or acting out of place. He asked for an explanation, and all the manager did was point to the wall behind the bar, typical of many ho-dunk bars with rowdy regulars. There was a college of pictures of patrons who were not allowed to return for whatever reason. Up there was a picture of me. I had never been to Texas before in my life let alone to such a small bar and a small restaurant. The manager threatened to call the police if we didn't leave. So we got the hell out of there. Spooked, hungry, and confused beyond belief, we walked back to our camper to grill up a couple of hot dogs and burgers for dinner. I'd heard about doppelgangers before. Just a silly horror story about how everyone in the world has a double that looks exactly like them. And in many versions, the double is unspeakably evil. I figured I just had another person who looked a lot like me out there, who caused a lot of trouble in a small town. My boyfriend and I went into town a couple of days later to pick up some supplies and food from the local market. As soon as we approached any citizen, their eyes would grow as wide as our waitresses, and they quickly ran in the other direction. I had to hide in the bathroom while my boyfriend gathered our purchases and checked out, then snuck out to join him when no one was looking. The more this happened, the more weirded out I got. We ended up relocating to another nearby town hoping to get away from the obviously spooked out town of Desdemona. However, no matter what town we went to, we encountered the same thing. Threats of cops being called, pictures of me hanging behind bars, terrified townsfolk refusing to come anywhere near us. Finally. We decided we would just avoid any towns or cities and found another isolated area to park and relax. We started a small campfire and sat around roasting s'mores and just having a good time. After a little while, we began to run out of food, and my boyfriend offered to go gather some lumber to burn while I promised to make him a double-decker s'more. Thirty minutes passed and he hadn't returned. I started to call out for him, but got no response. Getting worried, I got up and walked out into the woods with a flashlight, calling his name the entire time. Soon I began to see footprints of the dirt, so I began to follow them. Not much later did the footprints begin to turn into drag marks, and then the drag marks became littered with droplets of blood. I ran faster in the direction of the marks and out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement in the distance. I shined my flashlight and saw a girl running, a knife in hand, covered in blood. She looked exactly like me. 
A few yards of sprinting and I found what I was dreading. My boyfriend was tied to a tree, throat slit and multiple stab wounds to the chest. I didn't know what to do. I panicked. I untied my boyfriend and draped him over my shoulder and ran back to the RV. I took a shovel and dug a deep hole behind the most massive sycamore I could find. I buried my boyfriend and drove back home and told his family that he had gotten lost on vacation. Years later, he's still been on the missing persons list and no one knows what happened. No one but me. And now you. Who in the world would believe me if I told them that he was murdered by someone who looked exactly like me? I know nothing else of the doppelganger I saw that night. The infamous woman who stole my face and did horrific things. No name, no information, and no one in any other state mistook me for her. The glimpse I saw of her was enough to haunt me for an eternity, and I will never return to Texas for as long as I live. Doppelgangers do exist. They are not just a creepy fable or a silly happenstance where you see someone that looks remarkably like you. This woman was me, but clearly she also wasn't. So beware. If you ever find yourself in a town you've never been, and your picture mysteriously happens to be in a bar you've never heard of, or the townsfolk panic at the mere look at your face, get out. Get out immediately. Run like hell and never look back. And hope you never come face to face with your double. I always hated swimming in lakes as a little boy. It wasn't the weird creatures fluttering about in the deep or the thought of the odd pinching crawdads lingering beneath the sand or the shattered glass of the drunken teenagers smashed on rocks and left to the slow tide every morning. What bothered me was much, much worse. The reeds beneath the cattails and wading in the murky, dark water made the goosebumps on my body rise. It wasn't the duck itch my friends or family constantly caught, or the bites of the odd water beetle. It was the clinging, the grabbing. Nothing hiding within the unseen vegetation could be as terrifying as the pulling and ripping of the plants that cling to the body of the wading children in that river. My friends enjoyed swimming. The water is an intense deep green, but it doesn't bother them. They enjoy catching the odd minnow together and supporting one another on their shoulders, wrestling. I can't enjoy it. I won't. They know better than to knock me out of my canoe or throw me off the dock. I would rather watch when I can. Often I find it unbearable to watch them seeing the green wrappings being pulled from the water, wrapping themselves around the arms, chests, and necks of my friends. I shudder and continue to paddle, doing my best not to snag any of the botany that might find itself nestled onto my oars. They tried to get me in the lake once and only once. I pounded on Darren's back, screaming for my life. It wasn't just a joke to me. He laughed as I fell to the water, which seemed like an eternity. How would I swim back to the dock with all the reeds around? I regurgitated after surfacing. I was disgusted. I was crying. I stood on my tiptoes on the corner of a tall rock beneath the shadows, telling everyone that I couldn't move. Darren retrieved me from the canoe, almost tipping it as he pulled me up. I screamed again as I found a small lily clinging to my big toe. I wanted to tell my friends to get out each and every time. They prod and poke fun at me every time I put my bathing suit on and got into the canoe. But I wouldn't go into the water. 
They don't understand my terror or where it's coming from. They don't know my secret. Two years ago, before I had met all my closest friends, I loved swimming. I caught tiny fish and cared not for the plants that repulse me today. I had a specific part of the lake I loved to swim in. It was mine. There was a small path nobody else took that led into a green forested dip, where I had tied a rope to swing on a huge coniferous tree. I was alone and secluded. It was beautiful. The dragonflies buzzed and the odd jays would bicker amongst themselves. It was wonderful. It was my sanctuary. That one night I remembered the best. I'd gone for a run through the forest with my homemade fishing rod using corn as bait. I just stripped and hopped into the water when my grandmother had called me on the walkie talkie to come inside and get dried off. It was getting dark, but it was too late. I couldn't get out of the water. I couldn't move. I was snagged on something. It gripped me hard around my ankle as I waited with the skills I remembered in level 4 swimming. I struggled and pulled, trying to look down to identify what was wrapped around me. I pulled and pulled. It seemed to weakly pull back. I slowly grew terrified. I put my arm into the depths to break what was around my leg. I couldn't. It was thick, like the branch of a tree, yet hard to grip. I grew into panic. Help! Slipped from my lips, although nobody was around. Finally, as quickly as I was snagged, it seemed to just slip off. I swam as fast as I could to the shore and stared back. Water pounded rocks on the shore, but there was nothing. I got dressed and ran home, my heart still pounding. After a good night's sleep, some Sega Genesis and pancakes for breakfast, I ran out of my RV ready to go swimming again. The Jays cawed again once more. I ran around the paths through the forest, watching the odd scampering chipmunks or breeding dragonflies until I was lost. I meant to get lost. It was more fun that way. I loved exploring, and I was too nervous to go back to where I'd been swimming before. I walked for what seemed like hours, just as I had when I found my first spot, but I was surprised. There was someone else. I watched, hidden between the trees. A man on a boat throws a bag into the water, tied to an anchor. From the bag, I see a hand grasping for its life as it sinks into the depths, into the reeds. I tell you what. When life decides it's going to F you up for the rest of your days, it does its job pretty well. The name's Devin. My whole life I've lived in the suburbs of Nebraska, raised by your everyday conservative Christian parents. The odd part about these suburbs is the geography surrounding them. My town, for example. Lines just in front of a long, straight road that goes on for miles. Both sides are lined with a huge wall of trees, behind which lie the swamps. Because of the road's layout, the locals call it the Green Highway. Just to the north of these tree lies a small mountain range, ideal for long hikes and mountaineering. Why God decided to put swamps and mountains together, I'll never know. That is, if he even exists. But I'm not here to contemplate God's existence. I'm here to tell you how life effed me over. It started on a quiet summer evening. I lived only a few miles away from my parents, on the opposite side of the green hallway from them. We hadn't seen each other in a while, 
So they decided to drop me a line and invite me over for dinner. Having nothing better to do that night and unwilling to pass up a home-cooked meal, I accepted. Now, because the green hallway is mostly barren and because I love the great outdoors, I preferred the bike to my parents' house whenever I visited. Instead of buying a bike, I found it easier to simply rent one from the local bike shop, so I headed over to get one for a long ride to my folks' place. The owner was a guy named Mike. Nice guy, always happy to have someone's patronage. I rented bikes from him plenty of times, so he didn't even need to ask what I needed. While I waited for him to retrieve the bike, I listened to the radio he always had playing. Instead of music, however, I heard a woman making a public service announcement. Police have begun searching for Sharon Kim, a young woman who was recently reported missing. She is described as pale, with brown eyes and long black hair. If you have any information pertaining to this woman's whereabouts... Scary stuff, huh? Interrupted Mike as he rolled the bike out to me. Sure is, I said, especially in a small town like ours. Amen, brother, laughed Mike. Amen. And so, putting aside thoughts of this missing girl, I set out on the bike trip I had taken many times before, down the green hallway. I always loved biking down that road. The feel of the wind on my face as I whizzed by the trees was exhilarating. It felt like I was soaring through the wind as the world to my left and right melted into a green blur. It was liberating. A sensational journey that made you forget all your troubles. Until life decides that the ride's over. In other words, I was so absorbed in my ride that I failed to notice a bump in the road. Startled, I accidentally swerved sharply to the right, causing me and the bike to fall off the road and slam into a tree trunk. Luckily, I was wearing a helmet, so I was fine other than a few scratches on my arms, a minor inconvenience. Then I saw the bike and swore loudly. The front wheel had been bent inward from the impact, rendering it useless. Dang it, I thought. Mike's going to have my head on a pickle. Thoroughly pissed off, I picked up the bike and began walking it down the green hallway, continuing to my parents' place, figuring that I had already gone far enough to be close. As it turned out, I wasn't. And after about 10 minutes of walking, I realized that I still had plenty of road in front of me stretching as far as the eye could see at an endless asphalt strip. I pulled out my cell phone and tried to call my parents for help, but of course, there was no reception. At this point, the sun was beginning to set, and I was sure I was late. Just as I was about to resume my long trek, a faint rumbling pierced the silence. I felt my eyes widen with hope and excitement as I saw the source. A gigantic RV. I dropped the bike and stuck my thumb out with my right arm while waving with my left calling out for the driver to stop. The RV came to a screeching halt right next to me, its imposing size making me feel like an ant. The door opened and out walked the driver. He was a large man, standing about six foot with muscly arms. He seemed to be in pretty decent shape for a redneck. He wore the typical plaid shirt and blue jeans mix with a black trucker's hat on his head and combat boots on his feet. He had a scraggly beard and smelled faintly of flower-scented Febreze. Howdy, he said with a smile. You need a lift? I smiled back, relieved that he had stopped. You know it. Well then, you just hand me your bike and I'll pop her up in the trunk. I need to refill the tank anyways. I handed him the bent-up bike and walked inside the RV. 
It had a narrow hallway going straight to the back where the bedroom was. There were several wooden drawers lining the left with a marble counter on top and a wooden cabinet hanging above the counter. Next to the counter was a door, probably a closet or bathroom. To my right was a booth with a wide window behind it, curtains drawn. The cushions looked like new and the table was spotless. It was impressing by how clean the place looked. I decided to use the bathroom while I waited for the redneck to finish refueling the RV. I opened the door next to the counter, only to find a supply closet full of water and emergency supplies. Not finding any other doors, I made my way into the bedroom, figuring that what guy wouldn't mind if I was just doing my business. There were two doors, one to my left and one to my right. I figured one of them was the bathroom, but I didn't want to continue snooping around the RV like no one's business. So I quickly popped my head out of the RV and asked, Hey, uh, sir, mind if I use your bathroom? I asked, realizing that I didn't know his name. Franklin M. Name's Franklin, said the redneck. Sure, that ain't no problem. Just head to the back and the bedroom is on the door on the right in front of you. The bathroom is in there, so go in and then it's the door to the left. I nodded and headed back inside. I went back into the bedroom and as I entered, I noticed the strong smell of Febreze. But there was also something unusual underneath it. Something almost sinister. I couldn't figure out what it was. So I just decided to do what I came there to do. While I was in the tiny bathroom of the RV, the smell continued to waft through the air. It began the smell sickening, like something rotting. It became more and more pungent the longer I stayed in there. I became increasingly nervous. What the hell is that stench mixed with the Febreze? It smells like a decaying animal. It finally hit me that's what I was smelling was in fact rotting flesh, and my heart sank. The more I thought about it, the more scared I became. I tried to pass it off as my imagination running wild or my senses playing tricks on me, but it was all too real. I imagined a corpse being hidden somewhere in the room. The door on the right of the bathroom's entrance immediately came to mind. When I finished, I walked out and continued to smell the odor. At this point, the overtones of rot mixed with strong smell of flowers was unbearable. As I got to the entrance to the bedroom, it seemed to get stronger. I couldn't take it anymore and had to know what the smell was from. I leaned towards the door on the right and noticed how the smell became even more intense the closer I got to the door. I allowed my peaked curiosity to get the better of me. I opened the door and jumped back, horrified. Inside was nothing other than a small, blood-stained cardboard box full of bones and innards and flesh. I leaned against the wall and tried to catch my breath as I stared at the discarded remains, memorized by the sheer shock. My stomach felt like it had been tied in a double knot and it took all my willpower to not throw up. I was sincerely praying to God that those remains were not a person's. When I saw something round, like a mishappened spear, I concentrated on it, trying to make out what it was. As I focused more and more, I began to make out pale skin with bloodstains on it, the strands of long black hair. I felt the blood drain from my face and my knees grew weak as I remembered the radio report. She is described as pale with brown eyes and long black hair. Pale skin and long black hair. Long black hair. I had stumbled across Sharon Kim's rotting remains in a cardboard box. Unable to keep it down any longer. 
I leaned over and vomited into the box without even thinking. Terrified, I began to run towards the RV's door when I suddenly stopped myself. If the redneck saw me running, he'd know I'd found the girl's remains and he'd probably try to kill me. I plopped down on the booth, panting and trying to regain what composure I possibly could. After a few seconds, I decided to go and get some air, hoping that the redneck wouldn't catch on. When I stepped outside, he was still pouring gas into the tank. His sleeves rolled up. You almost done there, Franklin? I asked him, giving 110 into keeping my voice as calm as possible. Yeah, said the redneck. I'm just about done, so don't you worry. All right, cool, I said. I leaned against the RV, still reeling from what I had seen, and my eyes fell upon a scar running down the length of Franklin's right arm, ending at his wrist. Franklin's eyes flickered to mine, and then at his wrist. Although I looked away, he still caught me. Then he laughed. Ah, <laughs> you're probably wondering what that cut came from, right? He asked. Yeah, I said, feeling the shakiness in my voice. Get a grip, Devin. You're going to give yourself away. Well then, I'll tell you. See, I used to be a hiking enthusiast. I loved scaling mountains. I remember when I was about your age, I frequently climbed the mountains right over there. He said, pointing to the mountain range west of the trees. I had a friend who'd climbed the mountains with me. I'd known him all my life. Heck, we were like brothers he said cheerfully. We were always trying to challenge ourselves in our hikes. We would always be looking for a mountain that was taller than the one we had just scaled. We did this for years and we became a pretty good team, even earning a bit of recognition amongst our community. But then one day we decided to do something beyond either of our limits, trying to scale Mount Navarro. I recognized the name as one of the tallest mountains in the area. It was named after the first man to have ever scaled it. Scaling Navarro was a formidable challenge. I had even heard of a few instances where people have died due to misjudging the height of the mountain, thus contributing to thinner air and its weather conditions. There was no formal tours nor camps established for Navarro. We both felt up the task having been to extreme heights before but I didn't know what the hell I was getting myself into. The happiness in his tone vanished and was replaced with a much darker tone with a bit of an edge to it. While we were hiking, a storm hit. Our vision went the crap and we soon got lost. We both thought we were gonna die. We were already at a high altitude and our food was dwindling down to the last morsels. He trailed off. His face hardened, and his eyes became vacant, as if he was daydreaming. I gulped and asked, What happened? He shifted his glare over to me and replied, He lost it. My friend lost it. The thinner air or lack of food or something got into him, and he lost it. He tried to kill me, probably so he could eat me. He raised his arm, putting the scar right in front of my face. Clearly that didn't happen, but he did get me with his knife. At this point, my mind was in a vice grip. How I didn't break down right then and there, I'll never know. But the combination of seeing that girl's remains and Franklin's story was overwhelming. I could feel myself sweating, my heart racing, my limbs shaking and it took every ounce of will I had to keep myself composed. I didn't know how I did it, but somehow, some way, I did. I asked, What happened to your friend? Franklin's glare got harsher, and his voice got edgier. I did what I had to do. I killed him. When he cut me with the knife, I knew I had to fight him. So I knocked the blade out of his hands and he made a fist and made an outward stabbing motion towards me. I stabbed him in his back. My heart plunged into my stomach as my mind screamed for me to get away from him. 
but I knew I couldn't. That running would give myself away, and that his sturdy six-foot frame would easily catch me. I knew I had to play it cool, or at least try to, if I was going to walk away in one piece. Oh, I said, my voice trailing off. What was I supposed to say? Yep. Anyway, we're all good to go now, so off we go, he said, his voice smoothing out. So we both stepped back into the RV, and Franklin began driving down the green hallway again. I sat down at the booth to try and calm my nerves, cautiously eyeing the bathroom at the far end of the hallway, where Sharon Kim's remains were rotting away in a cardboard box, cloaked in a veil of flower-scented Febreze. I focused on controlling my breathing, making it steady and calm as to not seem frantic. Really, I didn't know what the hell I was supposed to do at that point. I was in an RV with a murderous redneck, driving down a bare road at sundown. My parents were probably worrying about me at this point, and I didn't even know if I would get to see them again. What if this guy decided to kill me too, so I wouldn't spill the story? What if I hadn't done a well enough job to keep myself calm and he knew I found the box? There were so many scenarios and thoughts swirling in my head. We drove for about 10 minutes, and I spent virtually the whole trip trying to sort them out. By the time I'd gone through all of them, my brain was fried. Oh shit, oh shit. As I, I'm as good as dead. This guy's probably going to kill me so I don't send the police after him. Or maybe he'll just kill me because he's that deranged. Is that how Sharon died? She found him and then he killed her just cuz? Man, and to think this started as a trip to my parents' house. How long has it been? Ten minutes? Jeez, oh, it feels like forever. Like this guy doesn't know where he's going. I froze mid-thought. My heart seemed to stop. And it felt like the wires in my head had just connected as I realized what was wrong with the whole scene. He never asked for directions. Hey, uh, I said with a visible shaky voice. I never told you exactly where I was headed, did I? Don't worry, he said casually. It's pretty obvious where to go once we hit the end of the hallway, right? He was right. I had been the town on the other end on the long street so many times that I knew it like the back of my hand. I was relieved that he hadn't asked me about my shaky voice or my silence. Yeah, I said. I looked out the windshield towards the setting sun and saw my parents' town in the horizon. Come on, come on, keep going straight in the town. Franklin continued going straight for the town. I began to feel more and more relieved that I wasn't going to end up like Sharon Kim. I was being spared. The town crept closer with every passing second. Closer. 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 Then, without warning, the RV made a sharp turn to the left, down another road I had never seen before. This road was a narrow, winding path surrounded by trees, Shorter than the ones lining the green hallway, and bearer too. Uh, Franklin? I said, my voice visibly shaking. What are you doing? Franklin didn't say anything. But it didn't matter. I knew I was going to be as good as dead, right then and there. My heart began beating faster than a hummingbird flapping its wings as my legs turned the jelly and beads of sweat began to form on my forehead. We just continued deeper down the path for what seemed like an eternity, until the trees grew sparser and the asphalt road turned into a dirt one. Soon we were driving up a hiking trail on one of the mountains. It was extremely bumpy, with rocks and even a few thick tree rods covering the ground. And the whole time, my whole body was locked up in fierce chains. Then Franklin spoke, his voice flat. You know, you really ought to learn to stay out of other people's business. 
I don't know what the hell you were doing snooping around my bedroom, but either way, I know you found that girl. I could see your face as white as a frickin' sheet when you stepped out of the RV. But at the same time, I gotta hand it to you for trying to keep your cool. When I told that girl, what was her name again? Sharon? The story about my scar? She couldn't help but try to run off. Sadly for her, she wasn't fast enough. Not like that mattered in the end. Hearing that last sentence added confusion to the swirling mass of fear in my head. It didn't matter in the end, what? Then the RV came to an abrupt halt in the middle of the dirt hiking trail. He turned and faced me, looking me dead in the eye. His eyes had a sedated, vacant look before them, the look of a madman. See, I wasn't entirely honest with my story. While I did kill my friend on that hike up on Mount Navarro, it wasn't because he had lost it. It was because I had lost it. When we were up there, our food supply was indeed getting low. We were already so high up that mountain, and the thinning air was starting to mess with my head. I started to get desperate, paranoid, afraid that I'd never get off that dang forsaken mountain. Around that time, my friends started to look pretty good, if you know what I'm getting at. My eyes widened, and my mouth hung open as I listened intently to Franklin's story. His real story. So I did it. I killed him. He put up quite a good fight, to give credit where it's due. He tried to slash at my neck, but I blocked him with my arm. He held up his scarred forearm briefly before resuming. In the end, it was for nothing. I gained the upper hand and soon I had more food. He and the rations I still had were enough to get me back down the mountain. On my way down, I knew I had to lie to avoid going to jail. I wouldn't have lasted there, and I'll admit, it wasn't easy eating my best friend. But I acquired a taste for human meat soon enough. He stood up and walked over to the drawer farthest from where I was sitting and pulled out a meat cleaver, freshly polished and sharpened as if it was never used. And yet, I knew it had been. And not long after doing so, I decided that I had to have more. Hearing those words did it for me. Before I knew it, I'd sprung out of my seat and bursted out the RV door and began sprinting down the path. I was running so hard I felt like I was an Olympic runner, racing for the gold medal in the 100-yard sprint. The scenery around me melted into a dark blur as I zoomed past it all, with the only sounds I heard being my breathing and Franklin catching up to me, his tall, heavy frame gaining on me with every passing second. I could barely process anything as I ran for my life. Then, behind me, I heard a faint thud and a loud cry ringing through the darkening sky. But I didn't stop. I didn't look back. I didn't pay it any head other than hearing it. I just ran and ran and ran. I ran past the entrance to the trail. I ran down the road towards the town. I ran to my parents' house and didn't slow down at all. When I got there, I collapsed onto the floor, panting heavily and crying as my parents tried to calm me as best they could, as if I was a five-year-old who had just had a nightmare. Minutes later, the police were in the house with me, questioning me. I tried to answer them as best as I could, still shaken and worn out by what had unfolded. I told them everything that had transpired from the moment I first saw the RV. When they went to the hiking trail where we had stopped, they told me that Franklin was dead. He had tripped on a tree root and had fallen on his cleaver. The blade sliced his heart. Hearing this did little to comfort me, though. That look in Franklin's eyes, that deranged, empty look in that man's eyes as he stared into my soul and told me his story, sticks with me even today. I've been in counseling for months, trying to cope with this whole ordeal. I'll admit, I'm doing much better than I was months ago, 
but I'm still reeling. Sometimes, I have nightmares of being chased, presumably by Franklin. I get anxious whenever I see an RV drive by my house. I never hitchhiked again. But more notably of all, I never entered the green hallway again. Last summer, I, my family, and my best friend John went on a trip to spend a few days in a cabin my dad rented. My father was very happy because how cheap it was. The cabin was located in, to be honest, the middle of nowhere. But regardless, I was happy to finally be able to get out of the house. We spent about three days driving in our small RV to the area the cabin was located in. Thankfully, I was only a child, so John and I had most of the RV to ourselves. When we arrived at the cabin, I couldn't help but be unsettled. The cabin itself was nice looking, but the huge forest behind it just seemed creepy. John and I jumped out of the RV and made our way into the cabin. Wow, not too shabby, said my mother when we stepped inside. Yep, I'm surprised such a nice cabin costs so little to rent, my father said in response. Come on, Mason, let's go outside and check out the backyard, John said to me as he grabbed my arm and led me to the door leading to the backyard. Stay out of the forest, boys. It's probably government property. My father yelled as we went outside. The backyard was a small area of dead grass, so you could guess it was pretty boring. After about 30 minutes of just sitting out there, John looked at me. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? John said with a mischievous look in his eyes. John was always a troublemaker. And as much as I hated getting in the trouble, I usually joined him in his crazy ideas, which very often got me in trouble as well. No, no, John, we're not going into the forest, I said with a stern tone. Come on, don't be lame, dude. Besides, we won't go too far from the cabin. What if we get caught, I said, trying to get John to change his mind. We won't, I promise he said as he anxiously waited for me to go with him. We climbed over the fence, separating the forest from the yard. My unsettling feeling returned tenfold as we began walking deeper into the forest. Hey, what are you doing? This area is restricted. Get the hell out of here. John and I turned to look to where the voice came from. Then, we saw an older man in a black trench coat with black sunglasses and a hat started approaching us from the forest. John and I ran as fast as we could back to the yard, climbing over the fence and ran into the cabin. After catching our breath, we noticed a note on the counter. I walked over and picked up the note. What does it say? John said. It's from my mom and dad. They are going to be gone for an hour or so, so they want us in bed by nine. I was very suspicious. My parents would never leave me home alone, but after a while, I shrugged it off. We spent the time until we had to go to bed by looking out the window to see if the old man was still there. Luckily, he wasn't, so we decided to go to bed. I woke up in the middle of the night to John shaking me. Ugh. What do you want, dude? I said, trying to keep my eyes open. The old guy isn't out there anymore. Let's go back. He said eagerly. Dude, you are insane. There's no way I'm going back out there. All right, I'm using my best friend card. John said with a smirk. When me and John were little, we made up this best friend card. Basically, any time one of us said it, the other person had to do what that person who said it says, because our friendship would be at stake otherwise. We snuck downstairs and grabbed two flashlights in our coats. Then, we carefully opened the back door, trying not to wake my parents, and left. Intense fear hit me as I saw the fog that enveloped the forest. 
It also didn't help that it was very dark that night. We once again climbed over the fence and began walking into the forest. It was very cold, which was odd since it was summer. The forest was silent, the only noise being mine and John's footsteps. After what seemed like hours of walking, the cabin was out of sight. All right, you had your fun, now let's go back, I said with fear present in my eyes. No, we haven't found what we're looking for yet, John said in response. What do you mean? You didn't tell me we were looking for something. This forest is empty, I said angrily. John interjected. That man is hiding something. Why else would he have been so eager for us to leave earlier? Whatever he's hiding, I'm going to find it. Not wanting to ruin our friendship, I continued the walk with him. Deeper into the forest, we noticed a large government building inside the chain link fence. No way. This is what he was hiding, John says in awe. Dude, this is government property. We need to get out of here or else we could get in a lot of trouble, I said as I grabbed his arm. Okay, we'll go back after I see what's inside, John said as he climbed over the gate. I climbed over the fence shortly after John. We got to the front of the building and noticed that the doors were unlocked and found ourselves in a long hallway with several rooms on the left and right walls as well as a room at the end of the hallway. The lights flickered on and off and most of the rooms were unlocked. When we made it to the end of the hallway, we stood before an unlocked door labeled Experiment Containment Room. John and I walked inside and found a large broken containment capsule. The walls were covered in large claw marks, and the shattered glass from the containment capsule was shattered across the floor. But by far the most disturbing thing was the blood-covered bodies lying on the floor. After a long stretch of silence, I forced out the words, Oh God. John was pale and looked as if he was going to throw up. Do you know what this means? John mumbled. Whatever's supposed to be contaminated in here, it escaped. Without saying another word, John and I broke out of our paralyzed state and ran out of the building. We slammed open the front doors of the building and saw the old man from before standing in front of us. What are you doing here? He yelled. Do you realize what you've done? We were just on our way out, sir. Please don't hurt us. We won't tell anyone. I begged. You need to run. It's already here. The old man whispered. Then, a humanoid creature jumped down the front of the roof of the building and landed on top of the man. The creature began ripping the man apart with its large claws and pointed teeth. The man's bones snapped and flesh was being torn from him as he screamed in agony. John and I ran in the direction we assumed was the cabin. The fog became more and more thick and made it hard to see. Then, a loud screech echoed from behind us. We knew that the creature was getting closer even though the fog made it impossible to see behind us. John and I kept running, even though every breath we took hurt our lungs. The creature's screeching became louder as it got closer to us. Then, we saw the cabin up ahead. As we got closer to it, the creature's screams began to get quieter until we could no longer hear it. We arrived at the backyard and quickly climbed over the fence. We slammed open the back door of the cabin, locked it, and ran to my parents' room. I flipped on the lights in their room only to find that they weren't there. Then, the house phones started ringing. I ran to the phone and answered it, hoping it was my parents. Mason, Mason, you need to listen, my father yelled through the phone between static. Dad, are you okay? Where are you? Mason, honey, you need to get out of the... My mother said before the call ended. John and I looked at each other with fear. Then we heard the screech again. 
We ran up the stairs into my room and locked the door. I ran over to my closet and opened the door. Come on, John, get inside. Just as John and I entered the closet, we heard the back door bust open. We held in our screams as we heard the creature climb rapidly up the stairs. Then, the creature clawed through the door to my room. John and I looked at the crevice under the door and saw the creature's long clawed hands. We closed our eyes. And the closet door was ripped open. So this just happened, and I'm still a little shaken by it, but need to share it. Every year, my grandmother gets us a spot at this RV park to visit the beach, and nearby there's a state park, so my friend and I decide to jog the one trail, but started later than usual, and ended up jogging to this bridge thing where we stood and talked for a while. And my friend tells me how he has an extremely good sense of danger. As we start jogging back, I start playing a video through my earbuds and start talking. And then my friend tells me that he had just gotten this extremely bad feeling of danger. And he turns towards me. Then he says, I think I just saw something black in the back field over there. And I turned to where he was looking and see what looked like a creature on all fours with dark black fur standing sort of like a cat with the center of its back slightly arched, standing about four feet tall. And as I looked at it, I got this overwhelming sense of fear, like fear and dread, I quietly tell him. I see it too, let's go. And we start sprinting the trail, the sense of dread dying down until I look back. And it boils right back up again. And we keep sprinting until we reach the road, at which point I try to keep a good pace because we're not out of the state park yet. And once we cross the park boundary, my friend tells me that every time he looked back, he saw the black creature dive into the woods. Any ideas on what this thing is.